This is Sid Roth, host of the Messianic Vision radio broadcast. In recent years, there seems to be an increase of people dying medically, going to heaven, and being brought back to life to report about it. The amazing thing is the similarity of experiences. My first guest, Dr. Richard Eby, is a retired OBGYN. He has served as president of the Kansas City College of Osteopathy and Surgery and is co-founder of the Park Avenue Hospital in Pomona, California. Dr. Eby, I understand that you died. Well, what a strange question. Tell me about it. A week after my 60th birthday, which I never expected to attain, frankly, because physically I uh, had overstrained mostly all my life. But nevertheless, the opportunity arose for my former wife and me to go back to her former home in Chicago when an aunt who lived there died. And in cleaning up the house, I took one of the heavy cartons of debris from the attic down to the second story, at which time a voice in my ear told me to go through the adjoining room out onto the second story balcony and drop the box over the railing to the ground, and thereby could save me time and I could get back to California, where I had so many appointments on my hospital and clinical book. So I dashed out, leaned against the railing, and instantly I found myself in paradise. Well, what do you mean instantly? What happened to you? As I leaned against the railing out there, which turned out to be eaten loose by termites and just sitting there, the railing gave loose. I, with my hands full of a box, plunged head first to a cement sidewalk two stories down, landed on the edge of it. The part of the head that hit the cement stopped suddenly, naturally, and the part that was hanging over the edge uh, continued on a bit. That split the eggshell completely apart broke the large vessel at the top of the brain. I was told that some of the brain tissue was left on the sidewalk, and the, the body ricocheted into a bush with my heels in the top and my head down the mud puddle. Were you dead, medically I, speaking? I was very dead. I was bled out. And by the time the, I was to learn later, by the time the paramedics arrived, they found the bloodless corpse hanging by its feet in the bush cut it down, put it on a board plank because it was muddy and bloody, and uh, headed back to the hospital to be certified as a corpse to go on to the funeral parlor. How long were you medically dead? It was 18 hours before I had any evidence of life. That, that's all I can go on. Did you experience uh, much pain when this occurred? None whatever. In other words, there is no pain to death. Death is the sudden release from all pain, all suffering, all sorrow, and all grief. You um, had the accident, you died, but instantly, what's the first thing you can remember? Instantly, faster than the word instantly implies, there is no time involved between the, the moment of physical death and the moment of arriving wherever we have decided by our own willpower that we want to go. And there's only two places, heaven or hell. So that instantly I found myself arriving with a thud in a place which was so absolutely ecstatic, beautiful, loaded with love and peace that I knew instantly it was heaven. Although at the moment I didn't know what part of heaven, because heaven of course is as large as the entire universe. So the transfer of the spirit body, which is that portion which keeps our physical going alive, the separation of which from the body is called death, that spirit body was instantly in the place which the Bible describes as paradise, a portion of heaven, only a very tiny portion, but that place where the saved souls are on hold until the time they shall get their resurrection bodies. It is an experience which is so ecstatic, so absolutely beyond human description in its wonderful release from all of the physical difficulties that this body can register upon the mind. It's just, well, the only word we have, of course, is heaven. <laughs> and uh, that's what I experienced. Instantly, I also heard myself say without having any ability to compose that thought, Dick, you're dead. 
it was a voice not mine. It was a voice seemingly coming out from me, and I heard it as if I had spoken it. But it was the voice which I knew instantly had to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah. It was absolutely indescribable, although I do attempt by saying it was judicial. It was absolutely authoritative. It was absolutely loving, humble, kind, and of course, accurate. We had quite a conversation while I was in paradise with Jesus, and it is mind to mind up there. Many of the people to whom we speak about heaven and paradise haven't realized yet that being no air up there, the use of the tongue and the use of air to transmit sound is obviously absent. There is nothing in the physics of heaven which is similar to the physics of matter here on earth. How did you feel when you were there? Physically, I guess that's a hard word to describe well, it. But. You have so many senses in the spirit body, unlike the five that we have here, that again, it's hard to say. It's total ecstasy. You can think so fast that it could not be computed. It is the same mind that Christ has. Dr. Eby, as a physician, and you've got to be a naturally curious type of individual, give us a description of what this spirit body was like that you had. I saw that my body in looking down naturally toward my feet was of the same size and shape as the one I now possess, an adult size. If you had met me up there in that body, you would have recognized me as Dick Eby simply by the conformity. And the difference was that the spirit body to my spirit eyes was transparent like clear glass. When I looked to the side, it would take on an opacity so that I'd know what it looked like. But you can see right through it. It has no weight. It has absolutely none of the senses which register pain, fright, discomfort. It is just totally, well, I use the word ecstasy. I don't know any better. There were no bones, no ligaments, no tissues, no organs. It is of a material which cannot be described. It is apparently that form which God Almighty created in order to provide a breath of life to the flesh which we enjoy down here on earth. Once that is removed from the flesh, the flesh is called dead, and the spirit has to go somewhere, either heaven or hell, because that's the way God invented the arrangement and provided a Yeshua and a Messiah to give us the choice. Uh, how did your mind operate? Any different? Fantastic. The first thing I realized is that I did not have the mind that we have here on Earth. This mind is simply the product of a live brain tissue. When that brain tissue suddenly dies, obviously the mind is gone. What we do have, and the only description I found is adequate in my opinion, would be that we suddenly have a little chip, like an electronic chip, of the mind of Christ. Now that chip, of course, has more information available to it than all of our brain would here on Earth. That's pretty close to what I was sensing. Suddenly I had a mind up there which thought with a speed faster than any computable speed on Earth. It was a transmission mind to mind with the mind of Christ, and he was speaking inside my mind, so to speak, and I was answering and or asking questions from there. The language of heaven with which we conversed is so absolutely perfect that instantly I realized that each word that the Lord was saying in this split second timing was absolutely perfection. It meant only one thing. He knew exactly what he wanted me to know and he conveyed to it me instantly. If I ask a question, it seemed as though he had it answered before I finished the question. While we were talking and walking in paradise together, walking is probably not the right word. A flying would be better because we had no weight. We simply went as we wished uh, without touching the ground. On yesterday's broadcast, we had asked you, Dr. Eby, since you are a physician and you're naturally a curious person, what your new body was like. Uh, 
Out of curiosity, how would you like that body right now? <laughs> if the Lord had given me the privilege of staying in paradise, I certainly would have taken it. Re really? I've, always, I've, I've talked to many, and that is the same response. Every one of them said, I'd rather have been there than to come back here. Well, the hardships of returning to this, of course, for us are negligible compared with the hardships it must have been for Yeshua to come down from being in heaven before that and live as he had to for 33 years. But it is a sharp change. But there is no question but what this home of, let's call it paradise, well, I'll just say right now, I, I asked the Lord, I said, now I know I'm in heaven because it's absolutely perfect and that's the only place there is perfection. But I said, what portion of heaven? He said, my son, didn't you read the book? That was the first time he was to ask me that question, which he repeated many, many times. And I said, what did I miss? He said, I told you in my book that I prepared paradise as a holding tank for the saved souls until that day when my father would turn to me on the adjoining throne and would say, the body which I've been preparing for you is now complete, the last person whom in my foreknowledge I know will be necessary to complete that mystical body of which you're the head, has just accepted you as Savior and Lord. Now he says, go get that body. That was the exciting answer to me. And I then, of course, asked, well, what will happen then? He said, my son, I will simply call to all of the saints who are in this area of paradise to join me instantaneously in the Shekinah glory cloud, and we will descend from the third heaven to the second heaven down to the atmosphere of the first heavens. And he said, Gabriel will sound that trumpet. I will call, come, and the great multitude and hosts of the saints with us will, of course, be glorifying me with a great thunderous applause. And he said, those persons who are believing in me, who are watching for my coming, who have accepted the way of life of seeking first the kingdom of heaven and me as their savior, he said, they will instantly hear my voice. Well, I said, who will hear it? And he said, I told you in my book, if you'd read it, that I know my sheep and they know my voice. And he said, they're the ones that'll hear it and instantly they will be changed into a spirit body, a resurrection body like as mine now. And he said, instantly they will rise from the earth to join the saints with me in heaven and they too will get their resurrection bodies. And he said, then we will return not to paradise in the third heaven, but to another section of heaven, which is the throne room where we will be with the Father forever and ever. Dr. Eby. Uh, tell me some other things that might be of interest in what you actually observed with your own senses in heaven. Well, one of the things, of course, that excited me tremendously was the beauty of the music. As a youngster, I had thought perhaps the Lord would let me go into music as a professional, but he said no later. But nevertheless, he gave me an insight into music that was useful, and that was that the music in heaven has no similarity in sound or form to what it is on earth where it's limited to airwaves and to say 88 keys on a piano up there the music flows so beautifully and it has an unlimited let's call it an unlimited vibration or set of waves such as down here it's not based upon a mathematical equation such as all earthly music is. It's just not made, of course, by anything that's made of the matter of the earth, such as cat gut or metal strings, drum heads, and so forth. It's of an entirely different level of hearing, and we don't hear it through ears up there because there is no air. You hear it directly on the mind. I said, who composed this music, Jesus? It's so absolutely unfathomable. Well, he said, didn't you read my book? I told you in my book, I make everything. And I make it for my pleasure and for the pleasure of my family. So he said, I'm the author, I'm the composer. Well, that was one thing. 
Another thing that amazed me was the beauty of a, an aroma in heaven, such as I had not up to that time ever smelled on earth. I've smelled it twice here since. An aroma which is a perfume so absolutely heavenly that it had to be made by God and for God. And I ask him, what is this composition of this aroma that's just saturating everything here? And he didn't answer. It was later when I was back on earth that I asked him again to tell me, and he said, it's in the book. And I started from Genesis to Revelation and found the answer. It's partly, for the benefit of those listening, the prayers of the saints. To me, this is one of the most beautiful little gifts that God's given that we don't generally recognize. That's the sweet-smelling savor, which is in God's nostrils, is partly, at least, according to Revelation 5 and 8, chapter, the prayers of the saints, which he has distilled, so to speak, into a perfect perfume just for him to enjoy because it represents the obedience of his children. Now the believers out there, whether Jewish or Christian makes no difference, they can have this great ecstasy of knowing that when they pray to the Heavenly Father, he enjoys it so much, obviously, that he actually changes it into a heavenly, let's call it uh, aroma, which he can enjoy and will share with us when we are with him around the throne. Is everyone's paradise the same? He said, didn't you read in my book that I never make two people totally alike? And he said, therefore, I gave them the desires of their hearts and the abilities and skills to do what they could with those desires. And he said, up there, up here, I have completed them. So everybody's paradise up here is individual. Well, I said, how would I get to see anybody? We said, you've already tested out the mind that I gave you up here, and it's instantaneous. If you want to visit anybody, or they you? You just think, and there you are together. So l let me see if I can understand this. If you, um, let's suppose that you are a, um, an artist, uh -huh. your paradise might be some of the greatest works of art the world has ever known in, in your valley. Is that, is that what you're saying? Precisely, it would be of an artistic nature far superior to anything you could have even dreamed of down here. If you're a musician, obviously you'd want your pleasant place of abode to uh, reflect music. And you go right down through all the categories which he places in the human concept down here. When you came back to life, what were the reactions of uh, some of the medical people, let's say? Well. The only medical person after I came back to life uh, who initially could get into the room in which my body was placed awaiting its uh, eventual disposal supposedly to the funeral home was this neurosurgeon who happened to be at the hospital at the moment that the corpse was brought in. He saw the skull broken apart with the brain exposed and no blood in the body. What, was he a Christian? No. He was an atheist, one of the most, he was a Jewish gentleman with tremendous responsibilities and capabilities who had just come back from the Vietnam War where he was head of all the head injuries for the United States uh, war effort down there. And so he had seen thousands of heads, but he told my wife that morning, uh, as she told me, that he'd never seen anything like mine and he wanted to do the immediate autopsy because it was obvious that I was long gone. But he came into my room, I remember faintly, the next morning after six o'clock when the Lord finished putting life back in the body, sat down in the chair and uh, I said, who are you? And he said, then he strung a bunch of oaths that I won't put over the air, but he said, in essence, he said, you're a dead man. Don't talk to me. I know you're dead. I've seen you before. He said, don't try to fool me. 
Well, I said, I'm no longer dead. The Lord just put life back. He said, I thought you were a physician. I thought you were a scientist. I thought you had some brains. But he said, I see they're all gone. He said, you're still dead, and I don't know how I can hear you speak to me. But he My said, goodness, how blind can an atheist be? I, I'll <laughs> never believe the depth of blindness in the Bible. It talks about people being blind to things that you and I probably wouldn't say that. But from God's standpoint, most of us are blind, I guess. But I felt that way, too. I just felt, how can this man be looking at me, be talking to me? And finally he said, oh, you shut up, he said, unless you have something to tell your wife. Uh, he said, you tell it to me and I'll go tell it to her because you're your dad anyway. Out of curiosity, this neurosurgeon may, uh, made the comment that you would need all sorts of cosmetic surgery and uh, you'd never be right again. And Gee, portions of your brain were on the cement and all your blood was drained out and your head is cracked in such an, a, a unique fashion. Um, I have a picture of you. We have not met in person. I've seen you on television. Um, it looks to me like either God performed a miracle or you had some tremendous cosmetic surgery. Which was it? <laughs> I had no surgery at all. None at all? None at all. And, uh, of course, that's another thing. The next day, I was to learn this, much of this later, of course, but the next day, the hospital officials ordered that the door to my room be sealed to any hospital employees. Why? Because they could not compute, they could not uh, write on charts anything that was going on or had gone on, and they didn't want their nurses and doctors and so forth to be confused because... They'd never had anything like this happen. <laughs> and then they ordered the chief of staff to see how fast he could get me out of the hospital. And it took five days because of the United Airlines difficulty in getting the Plumbers Union of Chicago to take out five seats to put a stretcher in an airplane. Thank you, Dr. Eby. We'll have you back later to hear about your experience in hell. Jeanette Mitchell died on the operating table and had a nine-hour visit to heaven. Listen to her experience. In two months and 11 days, in 1977, my best friend died. I found out I had glaucoma, which I don't have now, because the Lord healed me. I broke my back, the dog got stolen, and my daughter Annette died. How did you break your back? I slipped on the floor. Was it a, a type of situation where it was easily remedied, or was it perhaps you'd have problems the rest of your life? From What did the doctors tell you I had they looked an, at you? I had an 8-centimeter separation at L5 and a 1-centimeter separation at S1. Well, I'm not a doctor, so you've got to tell me what that means. Well, uh, that's my lumbar and sacral part of my back, and they fused it together mm -hmm. so it doesn't through surgery? Yes, they did. Okay, and did they say they felt it would work out just fine, or was there a risk that you might be uh, disabled the rest of your life? Did they tell you ahead of time? Before yes, you? they said I might not walk, but they said after the operation, they said it was, they had no idea that the L5 vertebrae was lo so loose it literally flipped, and it was a miracle I wasn't paralyzed before the surgery. Hmm. Now, on your daughter, what happened with her? She was hit by a truck on Coldstream Road in West Virginia. And uh, killed? By yes. this truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, out of curiosity, did you, uh, being such a godly woman, I'm just curious, did you have any premonition that your daughter might die? Well, we had planned for her to have a party at a hotel, but we just got a check in our spirit not to go forward with it. And my daughter, she just loved the Lord so much. You showed me a picture of her with just the, uh, uh, the, 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 the presence of the Lord over <laughs> her face yes. and her smile. She, she looked like she loved the, loved the Lord. Um, when she died, did you, uh, you being a Christian, your husband being a Christian, did you pray for all you were worth, so to speak, that she would live? Yes, and a lot of other people were praying, and they would visit the hospital and lay hands on her. Oh, well, why do you think she died then? Well, because she had a choice and she wanted to stay. And one of the people who came to minister said that she's in heaven right now which I knew she was, and that she has a choice of to stay or come back. Not to get ahead of our story, can you understand why she wanted to stay? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, back, but at that time, I imagine it was kind of tough. You, you didn't want her to stay, did you? Well, not being in, it's my only child, and 
of course, I love her, and I didn't want her to be away from me, but, you know, I know that she has a free will, and I know she loved God, and I absolutely know where she is. What, what effect did it have on her, on her daddy? It just devastated him. He pounded on the wall of the hospital, and it just vibrated. And he cried, and he just, he just got angry and withdrew from God because he didn't want to let her go. And then when they uh, were going to do surgery on you, tell me about the surgery on your back. Well, the operation took longer, and instead of monitoring it, they gave me more medication. And I had stopped breathing over and over again in the recovery room. So I was in surgery for four hours. And Why did they stop monitoring? Um, they just gave me more uh, anesthetic instead wow. of just waiting to see if I'd wake up because the operation's very bloody and they didn't want you to move. And so tell me what happened. Well, I stopped breathing over and over again and I went into the presence of the Lord. Did, did you remember what happened when you went in the presence of the Lord? Well, it doesn't hurt to die. It's just whatever caused you to die. If you live again, it hurts to live. And, um, I saw that, well, the first thing is you're in heaven like in the blink of an eye. I saw the Lord. I saw the gates. Wait a second. Before you, you continue, uh, did the doctors state that you died? Yes. Okay. All right. And it says in scripture to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that, that sounds consistent to me, scripturally. That was wonderful. So you, you, all right. The very first thing you saw when you were absent from the body. Tell me, first thing that, that you, you can remember seeing. Well, the lights of heaven, which is the Messiah, and I saw him. How did he look? Well, I don't know. There's peace, and there's such a bright, bright light that if you were looking at him in your flesh, you couldn't stand to even look at him because it's just so gl glorious. But, you know, just, I don't know, maybe 5, 10, or 6 feet. I don't really know, you know, height that mm -hmm. much. But what color hair? Sort of brownish, dark. And just, I'd say, if you had, you had to give a description of him, you'd probably just talk about his love. Did you see the, his love in his face, in his eyes? Or? Just, it, just his love permeates his whole being. I mean, that's the thing. It's just the love and the peace and the glory of God. The glory of God is all around, and his love and his peace just engulf you. And even when I had to come back, I didn't want to leave because of the love and peace. I mean, I agreed to come back, but you just don't want to leave because... So you really relate to your daughter wanting to stay? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. You, uh, you saw the Messiah. What else did you, did you see when you got up there? Well, the gates are 12 gigantic pearls. The streets are solid gold. God's not cheap. They're not paved with gold, as that old hymn I once heard said. <laughs> they're solid gold. And the walls, they're precious stones, and they're so bright. I mean, it's just vibrant, vibrant colors. I mean, it's just, it's glorious. And the music is just worship and adoration. It's just the most wonderful place to be. Did you see your daughter? Yes. You did? Was, was that right away or after a while? After a little while. Oh, I guess you got to tell me about that. <laughs> tell me about the reunion. We were in a garden, and in the garden, it was really beautiful. I mean, the grass was real green and lush, and the flowers were really, really bright. And on the far side, there were grape arbors, and on the other side, apple trees. And someone picked an apple at the far side, and it just grew right back. <laughs> and, and everybody was whole. You know, you just didn't see anybody that wasn't totally together. You know, in heaven, there was no missing parts or anything. I mean, it was just glorious. It's, and my daughter was wonderful. I mean, it was just great to be there. What did your daughter say to you when you saw her? Well, we just mainly talked about, you know, loving each other and things, and she was so happy. And it's just... Um, was she happy to see you? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was definitely a mutual feeling. But there's such a higher level of living there. I mean, you don't just die and float on a cloud. You're an integral part of everything that God is doing in this earth and in this whole universe. And everybody has things to do. Do you know what your daughter had to do? Um, no, I don't. And I don't remember, but... How about your grandparents? 
Well, they weren't, I didn't see them in the same place, but they were in heaven. But mm-hmm. I saw them, and I saw my great-grandma, and I saw other relatives, too. Not a lot of them, because God told me before a lot of them didn't make heaven, which wasn't very nice, but... Out of curiosity, did you think some of them had made heaven that had not? Yes, but I didn't really know until I got there. Tell me some more of your experiences in heaven. It was just beautiful. You could walk around. It was, I don't know, the music just engulfed you. And the glory of God, I mean, just the presence. When you say the music, was there like an orchestra? Or was there just music present? Just music present. It was, it was just holy. It was so pure. I mean, you couldn't even, if you tried to sing, you couldn't even keep up with, with it if you were, you know, in your flesh. It was just, just so, I don't know, music notes that I've never even heard on earth. They were so clear. I mean, there's just no flaw in it at all. It was just, the tone was just beautiful. Did Jesus talk to you? Yes. Tell me what he said. He told me he loved me, and he, you know, we just kind of talked about different things in general, but then he said I had to come back, or he wanted me to come back, and I said, well, how come I can't stay? Because I didn't want to stay before. Well, your daughter stayed. Why can't you stay? Well, he said I have something different for you to do, and when you're finished, you can come back home again. Did he tell you what that different thing was? No, but he said I'd know each step of the way. And I, I, I started to cry, but I had agreed to come back, and I knew I had to because I had given my word, and your word, you know, that's it. guest by way of telephone at her home in Crystal Beach, Florida, is Betty Maltz. In 1959, Betty died for 28 minutes, and we're about to find out what happened during that very significant 28 minutes. It all came to a scrambling halt when on a vacation in Florida, I ended up in heaven. (laughs) I had never been to Florida, and my family, my mother, my dad, My two kid brothers, my husband, my daughter and I, two families of us came here. The first night I ended up very sick in the hospital. The first doctor said it was an appendix ready to rupture. Second doctor said it was a vaginal infection aggravated by hot July weather in Florida. The third doctor examined me and said it was a tubular pregnancy, a four months dead fetus in the right tube and I needed surgery immediately. They let me go 11 days, and when they finally opened me up, they found out the first doctor was right. It was a ruptured appendix 11 days ago, and they found a mass of gangrene the size of a man's head. It had coated all my organs, and they had all started to disintegrate. What, what was the prognosis at that point? I mean, was it uh, was it a potential you would die at that yes, point? Yes, the, the doctor that operated on me said he had lost 200-pound men in 48 hours after a ruptured appendix. He didn't know how an 11-day lapse like this, how a woman with only 120 pounds to fight could last for 11 days, but he told my family that it would be over in probably 24 hours. But I lingered for 44 days in a coma, and um, I took pneumonia, my veins collapsed, everything went wrong that could go wrong. And at the end of that 44 days, they removed the equipment, and my family all went home to the motel to get some rest. Uh, Were you aware of anything going on during those 44 days? Oh, yes. I heard everything that went on in the room. In fact, the prayers of the people were wonderful. It offered hope. There were a lot of negative things said in the room that caused me to be worse. I have 102 pages of medical records. I was either worse after visiting hours or better, much better, according to the kind of visitors I had. But I heard everything that went on. And I prayed too, Sid. In fact, while you you were in the coma, you prayed? At this point, when I was in the coma, I began, there was no one in the room and uh, they had moved equipment, and I prayed for someone to help me because I had fluid in my lungs. A man came in the room and began to read the Bible to me. 
not knowing if I could hear at all. And he read Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. But after he left, I gasped, and I didn't understand that I was dying. Suddenly, I was launched instantaneously. It was not frightening, and it was very rapid. Now, let me ask you something, though. But it, it, when you died, was there pain attached with it? No. It was very exciting. It was like getting on a roller coaster at Disneyland. And when you peak the high point of the ride, I was launched from this country to a place as real as England or America. I walked through a meadow of waving green grass. Did you know that you were headed towards heaven? Oh, yes. I knew where I was. And well, Was I anyone had, with you? I looked to the left of me, and there was an angel about seven feet tall walking beside me. I also saw people who had died there that I knew. My baby brother and other people were coming toward me. How did they look? Through this meadow. They were not spooks floating around being nice. They were very natural. This was a very natural place. People were doing the same thing there that they did here, only in a very perfect environment. Or they were becoming there what they wanted to be here, only never quite made it. And then after I went through the countryside, without effort, the angel and I went up a hill, and he touched the gate, and it opened to me, and I stood inside of a brilliant yellow light, and I looked into a golden throne room. The light from the face of Jesus at the right of the Father in that throne room was so bright I had to look down. And when I did, it, that light reflected on a golden boulevard down the center of the city, and it shined through my cold body, and I stood tall and erect, though I had had three surgeries and been rolled over in pain for 44 days. I stood, and then I began to run to the right of me, and I ran through what looked like northern lights or airport beacons or laser beams. These were prayers ascending from the earth, going into that throne room. And on one shaft of light was my father's voice. When they called Mary Barton, a registered nurse, called my parents and my husband, and they arrived at the hospital, my dad went over to the bed where I was covered with a sheet, and he moaned, Jesus, to comfort himself. But he said, in that one word was a wish that I had not died. I never wanted to come back, but his one-word prayer changed my mind. And in, I in other words, the prayer ascended right up to heaven, and yes. you heard it as if you were right there in that bedroom? See, this taught me how to pray when I came back. I never saw prayers as energy rays that are shafted direct to the throne room, but that's what prayer is. And his prayer was answered. I came back, and I looked through the roof of the hospital into my room. And a light was shining through the window, which was the morning sunrise. On the ray of light were ivory letters printed. And if you remember, Art read to me. He sent his word and healed them. And I saw these ivory letters, and as I squinted, I read St. John 11:25. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And I reached up to see if it was hallucination or real, and I touched the word of God, and life went in my fingers and in my body. I sat up and pushed the sheet off my face and scared a whole room full of people. I can imagine. Uh, in other words, the room was filled with, with your mourning relatives? And, yes. And you're sitting up? Yes. And... Uh, about 20 minutes later, my doctor was called back to the hospital, and he was terribly embarrassed. And then he told me we had to operate immediately. Well, 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 what do you mean your doctor was terribly embarrassed? Well, he signed a death certificate, and now I'm sitting up in bed. It looks to the other doctors as though he was negligent. And finally, he had to conclude that if he could explain it, it would not be a miracle. I, I don't understand. Do time to... I, I don't understand. What do you mean? If he could explain it, it would not be a miracle. Well, I told him where I went. I saw him the light. I said, when the light shined through me, uh, 
now there's no more pain. And he pulled back the sheet and he said, well, this is an unexplainable. Already you have new pink skin forming on all three incisions. Was he a believer? No, he wasn't before. <laughs> And then this was the bottom line when Guidepost wrote my story. And then just before I was on to tell the truth with Gary Moore, they contacted him. He said wherever she went, she came back well. And something else that dawned on me, uh, there were no labels. When I arrived at that beautiful gate, they did not even ask me what church I went to. The only passport visa was Jesus the Son of the Living God. And immediately, I saw him at the right of a father in a golden throne room. And it was awesome. Did you, uh, you, you told me that you saw some of your uh, deceased relatives there. And did they look like they did when uh, they died? Or yes, did they, they look younger? Or No, they were very natural. And the Bible says one day is as a thousand years with the Lord. I believe children grow very slowly there because we've got forever to mature. And what, uh, to the best of your understanding, what were the people doing? They were doing the same thing there they did here. Tell me, tell me what you saw them doing. I, everyone, uh, Sid, I have interviewed 103 people who have died and come back now. And everyone that's had a death experience since 1960 have seen construction going on there. There was an anticipation a getting ready for a large number of people that will arrive there at one time. Now, when you say construction, are you saying you saw people with uh, hammers and they nails? Were and, and they were, were, were they building, though, the way they would be building on Earth, or what, did it look different? Very much the same, only the, uh, the architecture was so awesome, it would take many programs to describe. How do you know you didn't just imagine this experience? You were in a coma for 44 days. Yes. Well, I asked my doctor, and he wondered if it was hallucinating. But when he pulled back the sheet and looked, they had never even sewed me up. I had been operated on three times. There was new pink skin forming on all three incisions. And he said, wherever you went, you came back well. I realized the only thing that you take with you to eternity is people. What do you mean by that? And I've come back with a love for people. You can't take things, but you can invest in people, love people, save people, heal people. The only thing you take with you is people to eternity. You just go naked as you are before God. See, we the things which cannot be seen are eternal, and the things which are visible, are temporary. Do you have problems forgiving people after this experience? Not anymore. <laughs> I mean, you could, could, uh, now, now be candid. You go into the restaurant, you order something. Uh, hey, they, Sid, they after give you your the... appendix have ruptured and you've had pneumonia and you lay open decaying in front of people, nothing bothers you after you've died. You'd be surprised. But, but this was back in 1959. Do you find yourself slipping some now? Do you know what? This was so vivid. This is a living testimony. You do not take something like that very lightly. It's not something you forget. Mm -hmm. 